Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for today's program, sponsored by Brightview Senior Living and presented by Jennifer Fitzpatrick. Before we get started, I just want to go over a little bit of housekeeping. Everybody is muted, and that's just to eliminate any background noise. However, we we highly encourage you to participate by using the chat feature. As a reminder, to find the chat, just scroll across the bottom of your screen and where you see the little button that says chat, you can go ahead and write your comments, ask your questions. Everything is only being seen by uh, the, the panelists, myself and the, and the presenter, and that's just for privacy purposes. So please don't hesitate to do that. We really um, value your input and your your feedback. So please feel free to to um, make a comment or pose a question for Jennifer to respond to. As I said, um, we are so grateful for today's event being sponsored by Brightview Senior Living. And I'd love to invite Karen Williams, who's representing Brightview, to come on and introduce herself and give you a little bit of information about their communities. Karen? Hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's good to see some familiar names on there and I appreciate you all RSVPing for today's event and the others of other events that we'll be having for our educational series. Uh, so as, as Stephanie said, my name is Karen Williams and I work with uh, Brayview Senior Living. I've been with them for 10 years. So very proud to uh, work for such a great company. I do have a quick PowerPoint to get us started and then Jen will join us. So, oh, here it is, share my screen. And you should be able to see my PowerPoint. Does that look good? I think so. Uh, okay, so Brightview Senior Living. So again, a lot of you are already familiar with Brightview because uh, you reached out to me and we've already been in touch and you've been engaged with some of our communities already. But just to be sure, wanted to give you a very quick overview of the company. And there we go. Uh, so why Brightview Senior Living? This slide itself is such a big deal to us because you can go to a number of different senior living com communities that is in a bright view and you get um, you get care, you get meals, you get all the things that we talk about. Bright view in particular is very works very hard at making sure that we're a great place to live and a great place to work. And we do that. We have that statement in that order that we first want to be a great place to work because we know that happy caregivers, and happy associates, they they join us, they stay for a long time, and they treat our residents well. Um, this slide represents some of the awards that we have won, um, including people's companies that care and Fortune's best workplaces for women and in aging services. We actually just won that award again, we found out on Monday. So that is for the fifth year in a row. So it makes us so proud to know that even when we survey our associates, they also share with us that we, we truly, truly work very hard to make it a great place to work. So a little bit about Brightview. So we're owned and operated. Our home office is out of Baltimore City and our partners and executives all live in the area. We are a rental model, so different than what we call a, a, a CCRC or a continuing care retirement community where there's a large entrance fee, we're rental. So you sign a lease, you have more flexibility over uh, your stay with us, as well as stay in more control of your money. Uh, we are a continuum of care. And what that means is we start with independent living. So most of our communities have independent living. Some of our communities are what we call standalones, which does not have the independent living component. But there are, we do have independent living in our communities where someone is living in their home and they say, oh, I'm, I'm tired of doing maintenance and I'm tired of snow and I'm tired of this and that and choose to move into a bright view to live that maintenance-free life and just kind of have a good time and be able to, to get back into hobbies and 
things that they've loved to do and, and maybe you couldn't get back into it. Uh, the great food, we have wonderful food, of course, safety and security is, is a primary focus for us and lots of engaging programming that take place within independent living. Within independent living, two meals are part of rent as well as all the things we just talked about. So maintenance, housekeeping, engaging programming and such. Next, we have assisted living um, or personal care. If we have some folks on from Pennsylvania, and that is, of course, our one of our care neighborhoods intermingled within independent living in most cases. And we offer all the things we just talked about, as well as a high level of, of care and customer service and three meals a day. And then we have dementia care. This is actually a picture of my husband's grandmother who turned 100 in April and she is at one of our bright views. So I'm so glad I get to see her a lot. But we have our dementia care that's a secure neighborhood, very strategically designed for those living with dementia. And here's an idea of where our communities are. Of course, we have more in Virginia. We have more up north in New York, Massachusetts and such, uh, but this is the more locally focused communities. And that is it. So I will be on for the whole call. Jen, Jen's gonna take it from here, but I'll be here if any questions come up or feel free to chat. And I think you all have my email, so, but I'll put it in the chat and don't hesitate to reach out with any questions. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and I will mute. So thank you so much and enjoy your time today with Jen. Thank you so much, Karen. We appreciate it. And again, we appreciate your, your sponsorship of today's program. What is senior living? Signs that it's time to discuss a move or make other big changes for your older parent. Before we get started, I just want to give you a little bit of background information about our presenter today and introduce her more formally. Do you want to better understand senior living options? Are you helping care for a parent or a loved one who might need more support and help? Could you use some ideas on how to start conversations about housing options for yourself or a loved one? If you answered yes to any of these questions, you're in the right place. A former psychotherapist, today's presenter has been featured in national media such as the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, Chicago Tribu Tribune, Forbes, Fast Company, and many more. She is also the author of the newly released Reimagining Customer Service in Healthcare, as well as Cruising Through Caregiving. When she's not speaking and writing, she can be found serving as a below average first mate on her boat. Please join me in welcoming all the way from Kent Island, Maryland, Jennifer L. Fitzpatrick. Well, hello, everybody. I'm so thrilled to be here with you today. And thanks for Brightview for putting this on. Uh, we're going to cover a lot of material today, but like Stephanie said, feel free to jump in at any time if you would like to ask a question, make a comment, anything that you would like to share. And also, I'm going to be asking you some questions that I sure hope that you can uh, share some answers to. And without further ado, the first question is, and I'd like to ask you to put in the chat section, uh, just so I know who's here with us today, what best describes you? A, I have a parent or loved one that lives at home. B, I have a parent or loved one who lives at a bright view. C, I am an older adult considering whether senior living is right for me or other. And if you write other, feel free to tell us a little bit about that. Okay, so got an A. Give everybody a minute just to write into the chat section. A. A lot of A's. Okay, great. A lot of A's here. Uh, okay, um, mother-in-law's in a different community. Okay, A. Okay, great. So so basically, it's it seems like it's mostly folks that are here to learn more about how to work with their loved one. A parent's getting older. Yep, your loved one lives in the community trying to plan ahead. That's awesome, Karen. So, so yes, yeah, so that's great. Thank you. Uh, and if you are here and you're simply an older adult thinking about if senior living is right for yourself or for uh, the future for you, that's great too. It doesn't seem like anybody's identified themselves that way, but if you're here, we welcome you as well. 
So senior housing options, there is a lot of noise out there, uh, lots of noise. And so real briefly, what I wanted to do, and Karen uh, Williams touched on this really briefly, uh, but I want to just elaborate just a little bit uh, about what senior living options are. Just take a, a quick second to share um, what, what we're talking about today versus what we're not talking about today. So today we are not talking about a CCRC, a continuous or continuing care retirement community. And this is one of those organizations that is a lot of money down to even begin to look a uh, big, huge buy-in that you, it, it's a big contract and it's a single community that has a nursing home, then an assisted living, then an independent living. But that is not what we're talking about today. That's an option out there, but that's not what we're talking about today. On the other end of the spectrum is simply a nursing home or skilled nursing facility. And that is something that if maybe you or a loved one have experienced, you had a hip replacement, you, you fell, you had a stroke, and you go for rehab short term, Medicare typically will pay for that. Or sometimes somebody goes, if they have very, very uh, advanced dementia where they're they're not able to do anything for themselves, uh, that sometimes can occur. But then also if somebody needs extensive help with many activities at home, that is, is not what we're talking about today, but that's another option out there. But what we're talking about today, Brightview is independent and assisted living. And so independent, as Karen talked about, all of the wonderful, wonderful amenities of simply not having to worry about shoveling snow and not raking leaves and fixing roofs and all that. Uh, assistant living, of course, is a step further or uh, personal care. If you're in Pennsylvania, it's a step further with lots of help, depending on what your needs are, but help with with daily activities that you would need to do to to be uh, to to be happy at home. So just wanted to share that there's a lot of different options out there. But today we're talking strictly about independent and assisted living. So what I want to do before we get too much into how to talk to your older loved one, I uh, want to talk to you about quality of life for a moment. And so you see this pie on the screen, and this pie represents the different areas and aspects of our lives, our physical health, our intimate relationships, our finances, our spirituality, our psychological health, socialization, work, volunteer. Some of us maybe only care about two or three areas of this pie. Others of us care about all of the areas of this pie. And so it's very individual uh, for what one person considers to be high quality of life. Some people, once they age and they maybe retire or they don't have children at home, they do not necessarily care about having any job or doing any volunteer work or anything, a role like that but they care about their physical health and they care about their socialization and they they care about their finances. I remember when my grandmother lost my grandfather, she wasn't really as concerned about having an intimate relationship anymore. She was really concerned about physical health, social life, and spiritual and finance. That was what was important for her. So what I just want to encourage you to do today and feel to take out a pen and a paper if you don't have one ahead in front of you or if you're I know you're on your computer many of you maybe pull up a word document and feel free to take some notes based on this pie what sections of the pie do you think are important to your loved one so your parent or your aunt your uncle whoever it is that you're on this program about what areas of the pie do you think that he or she cares about and is important to them? And feel free to write into the chat section if you would like to share. You don't have to, but if you want to. But it's really important to be thinking about that. What are the important areas for your loved one? And again, if you would like to share, you're very welcome to do that, but do not feel like you have to. Social. Some, I have somebody saying that they care a lot about the social for their older loved one cares a lot about socialization. Mostly people will say physical health is a big one that often comes the top priority. So the second one that I'm going to show you is about your life. Um, yeah, I've got um, 
Yeah, uh, interesting. So Susan is saying, my loved one wants to move to a different community because socialization needs are not met. And I'm so glad that you brought that up, Susan, because so much about senior living, independent and assisted living, it's not just about physical health. It, it, it's not just about psychological health. It is about the socialization. It's about being able to engage with others, to have meaningful activities, to be able to have something to do almost at any time of the day that's going to be stimulating and engaging and to try new things. And that's a big reason that people move to senior living. But I think a lot of people don't necessarily think of that as the top reason. A lot of people think about physical health. So what I want you to do with the pie now is as the adult child, because everybody identified as an adult child. Uh, so if you're an adult child on here, how do you feel like, what, what parts of the pie? And, and some of you might say all, or some of you might just say, just put in the chat section all or some. Okay, we got physical, financial, social. What parts are important to you? And if you want to say all, for me, it's all. All of it's important to me. Some, all, okay, thank you. So what we're trying to do all, another all, what we want to be doing today as we talk about how to have conversations and determine what makes sense for your loved one is I want you to be thinking of the things that are important to your loved one which pieces of the pie? So if, if you said that your loved one, what's important to them is their physical health, their spiritual life, their social life. Are those pieces of the pie being fulfilled right now where they live? So if you feel comfortable writing in a why, the pieces of the pie that my older loved one, that, that are important to my older one, loved one are being fulfilled or end for no, what would you say? Yeah, I'm getting a lot of no's. Thank you. Okay, and then this one I think can be a little bit harder because it's about us. When when we are looking at our older parent, we're looking a, a little bit, not totally objectively because it's somebody that's in our life that we love, somebody probably that raised us. But I think it's a little bit harder to be uh, introspective sometimes. So for yourself, for the parts of the pie that are important to you, and some of you wrote in all, what is do you feel like you're getting your needs met currently with your parent living where they're living? Are you able to fulfill what you need to for the pe work, physical health, psychological health, social, financial, intimate? Feel free to write into the chat section why, yes, my loved one where they are right now, I'm able to have the life I want or N would be no. And I know this is a little bit Kind of a tougher conversation to have with yourself because you're probably really focused on your loved one so i'm getting a lot of no's yeah when your loved one is not happy susan says as it's hard for the children that's very true so for quality of life i'm gonna share with you personally for me Quality of life for me is very easy. And for my grandmother, uh, who I mentioned earlier, it was really easy. We are, we. my great grandmother passed away uh, eight years ago. Uh, she was a big reader. She loved to go to the beach. She loved to go out to lunch and dinner and spend quality time with her friends, family, and grandchildren. And that was kind of what she cared about. She didn't care about hiking. She didn't, at church, she liked to go to church too. But she didn't care about necessarily dating. She didn't care about going hiking or really traveling. It was very simple to her. And so all of us have a different idea of what quality of life means to us. So our goal as loved ones, adult children of people who are aging is what we want to do is figure out, do they have quality of life? And that's why I shared the pie with you to look at, does this, the different areas that are crucial to their quality of life, are they being met? And are they being met where they're currently living? And so many of you are saying no. And so that's an important thing to acknowledge that the quality of life that's important to my loved one is, is not necessarily being met where we are right now. So if you would, um, 
I'm going to just, just for your own purposes, like where would you describe your quality of life today overall? Would you say it's excellent, good, fair, poor, non-existent? And if you want to write in the chat section, we'd love to hear from you. Your quality of life in total. Good. Okay. Good. Good. Okay. This is actually very good news to see a lot of goods. And I haven't said somebody, I haven't seen somebody say non-existent yet. What's so great about that? Somewhere between good and excellent. Okay. That's terrific. But what is important to note about that is that you're probably being proactive because if things were really stressing you out about your older parent and their circumstances and their quality of life, you probably would be fair or below. So now I've got a little bit of probably a little easier question because I know this one's a little bit, you know, it's a little bit harder to be introspective sometimes. I want you to think about for your loved one, for your parent, where would you put theirs? Where would you put your parents' quality of life? Fair. Fair to poor. I have a good. Poor. Okay. Feel free to keep writing in. And if you have any comments at all or questions in addition to the questions I'm asking, you're very welcome to write in. So the goal today and the reason that we're doing this program today is to look at how do we improve their quality of life. Now, if they're already at a good quality of life, that's that's fantastic, but could we maybe get them to an excellent? But for those who put fair and poor, Ha happily, no one put in non-existent. We absolutely can get them up. So it's it's a matter of looking at, is their current living situation serving them? Is it enhancing quality of life or is it diminishing their quality of life? So for the adult children and family today, this is where I'd really like you to tabulate on a piece of paper or on a Word doc take a moment and think about these questions that I'm going to ask you. Do you think your loved ones? Oh, okay. So um, Melva's saying it's not for your parents. It's for yourself. Okay, great. I'm glad that you mentioned that. We did a little poll earlier and we didn't hear uh, anybody share that. So that's great. Thank you for letting me know. Um, so these questions are though, um, you can, if it's for you, Melva, you're here for yourself. That's great. But for the family members, you want to be considering this question about yourself. And if you're here, I'm sorry, if you're here for yourself, you want to ask this question, has my health conditions gotten worse lately? Family members, adult kids, you want to think, has mom or dad's health conditions gotten worse lately? Yes or no? And just tabulate how many yeses, how many noes you're coming up with. Okay, people are writing into the chat section, which is great. I really appreciate you sharing. Some people are writing yes. Some people are writing mom is worse, okay? But I want you to keep track for yourself. How many yeses and how many noes are you getting right now? So again, it, for, you, for those of you who are on this program and you're, you're addressing yourself, that it's you're thinking about your own quality of life, answer this are you spending more time at home than usual and if you're looking for your older parent is your parent spending more time at home than usual yes or no now when i ask that question i don't mean necessarily so if you're if your dad's always been one to like to watch football game he's watching the eagles he's watching the ravens and that's kind of his thing. He loves, he's a homebody, always has been. And he's still spending the same amount of time at home. That would be a no, that he's he's same amount. But if your loved one used to love, like my grandmother did, going out to lunch, visiting family, going out shopping at Macy's, that was her favorite store, then we would want to put a yes. Yeah, yes, we're hearing some yeses, okay? 
more time at home than usual. Has ambulation gotten worse? So getting around, so walking, getting to the bathroom, getting up out of bed, getting from a chair to standing up. Has that gotten worse lately? And I'm hearing a lot of, of, of the yeses. Uh, right. Okay. So I appreciate what you're sharing. Mel was sharing a little bit about the health conditions and some mobility issues. And then this is specifically, so Melva, this is not for you and your husband, because you probably wouldn't be able to answer this. Uh, but uh, for you who are adult kids, are you propping up your loved one who's living independently? Now, what do I mean by propping up? Now, some of you might automatically know what I'm talking about. But when I say propping up, I mean that your loved one is, and I'll give you the example of my grandmother again. When my grandmother, she was very, very independent until about the last year of her life. And she did for herself. She was super independent. And in the last year of her life, very slowly but surely, her ambulation got worse. Her ability to drive herself was was not there anymore. She used to love to cook. She really stopped cooking. But my grandmother was convinced that she was still living independently. And what one of the things that I had to have a conversation with her about at one point was you know, when we started to talk about senior living or bringing help into the home, but really our goal was, was senior living, we talked about, but are you really living independently? Somebody's always driving you when you want to go to the mall now. Somebody's always driving you when you want to go to the doctor. You've had six hospitalizations in the last eight months you somebody is often sleeping over it, we got to the point in our family where i want to say like six straight weeks somebody slept overnight at my grandmother's house and she was still adamant that she was living independently and so one night when i it was my turn to sleep over i i she said i i had this conversation with her and she said well I don't need anybody to sleep over. And I said, well, well, then why am I here? Why did I drive up from Maryland to Huntington Valley, Pennsylvania to spend the night tonight? And she said, well, it's just nice having company. And I said, okay, well, if you're really independent, why don't you do everything for yourself while I'm here? Just pretend I'm not here. Just we'll watch our shows together. We had some shows that we both liked. We'll watch our shows We'll eat together, but just do your own thing. Get to the restroom by yourself. When you want a beverage, go get the beverage for yourself. And if, if you if, don't have me remind you when to take your medicine, just remember. And very quickly that evening, when she really was having trouble getting herself to the bathroom, and when she was forgetting the time, and my grandmother didn't have any dementia, but she was on so many medications that she was forgetting the time, that she started waking up to the idea a little bit of, okay, yeah, maybe I'm not quite as independent as I had been. Now, I don't want you to think that I hadn't been, that that conversation just happened. And suddenly she's like, yes, I'm going to go to senior living. No, that was not how it went. I had been for probably three to six months planting seeds and saying, listen, we need to really examine this. We need to look at this. You're, you're having trouble getting around your apartment. You're having, you're falling a lot. You're having all these different things, different emergencies happen. You used to love to cook. You used to go out to lunch with your friends. You haven't been to church. And so I had been pointing out for quite a while how she wasn't having the quality of life that she once had. And that night when I said, you know, why don't you just pretend I'm not here? It hit home. Now, how many people on here think that that was really mean of me to say to my grandmother, you know, I'm here, but you're going to do everything yourself. Some people have accused me of, gosh, that wasn't very nice, but I'll tell you what happened. That really launched us in because it wasn't just me telling her, hey, you're not independent anymore. You're not independent anymore. 
Um, yeah, Susan, yeah, it did. It really worked. It was me showing her that she wasn't independent. And I wasn't trying to be mean. I wasn't trying to hurt her feelings. My grandmother was one of the best friends that I've ever had, and I miss her very much. But what I was trying to do and what I did accomplish is opening up the greater conversation. And and she didn't like it, but she was ready to have the conversation about moving. And so sometimes we have to stop propping up our loved one because they believe that they're independent when that they, they with their getting around the house or remembering medicines that they could be better served in an independent living or in an assisted living community where they, they fell while they were shoveling snow or that they just don't feel like cooking meals anymore, or they're just eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches that when we're constantly dropping off meals and driving to the doctor, listen, there's nothing wrong with doing any of that. And it's, I think it's commendable when we do it. Like when my grandmother, 20 years prior to that, she had broken both of her shoulders when she was in her sixties. And for four weeks, she was completely immobilized. And she couldn't use her hands, her shoulders, her elbows, her arms, nothing. So couldn't cook, couldn't feed herself, couldn't help herself out in the bathroom, couldn't shower, nothing. So my aunts and I, for four weeks, we committed that we would be her arms, her hands, her fingers, her elbows. And we did it for four weeks. We did everything. But that was temporary. And she got better. And then she went back to living her independent life. But in a lot of cases, we're in situations where it's not going to get better, that it's just going to keep declining. Now, sometimes if you're saying yes to a lot of the questions that I'm asking, what we find a lot of, yes, Gretchen, I will repeat that in a moment. What we find a lot of times is that when we uh, are propping that person up, we are keeping them at home and they're going to sometimes even miss the opportunity to go to independent or assisted living. And they're going to be too high a, a level of care. Lots of data suggests that when somebody moves at the right time, when they've got a few problems, then, then they are able to really benefit from independent and assisted living because there's delicious, nutritious food right there. They're not just eating sandwiches, that there's help there, there's security. No one's having to shovel or rake and have to risk falls and things like that. So we don't want people to miss the opportunity if they're a good fit for senior living. So um, Gretchen, you said, could you repeat the kind of question or language you use to help the other person reflect on independent, how they actually are. Um, Gretchen, if you could just write it into the chat section, are you talking specifically um, about my, well, I'll just repeat what I said to my grandmother. What I said to her is she, I said, I said something about how, you know, I really think you're having challenges being home that you you're having trouble getting to the bathroom. There's been, you've had six hospitalizations in eight months. You feel like you need people to sleep over a lot. You haven't been cooking. You used to really enjoy cooking. You're not driving anymore. You used to love to go meet your friends. You're not going to church anymore. I was just simply reminding her of things that she used to enjoy doing that she's stopped doing. And I reminded her of things that she used to do completely without help that she's now relying on somebody for help. I hope I'm answering your question. If if you want, if I'm not answering the question, please write into the chat section and just let me know if there's something more. But that night, what I said to her, okay, got it. All right, Gretchen's saying yes. So now what we're going to do is I want you to be thinking about uh, the, another question. Has medication compliance fallen by the wayside? Now, a lot of us, as we age, we are on more medications. Now, if you are not, that's wonderful but it's likely your loved one probably is on some medications. But I want you to be thinking about the last time that you were ill and maybe you had a cough syrup, maybe you had an antibiotic, maybe you had Tylenol, maybe, who knows? And maybe you had a bunch of different prescriptions that you were supposed to be taking. Plus you had to take your vitamin and, and 
how many people have ever fallen off medication compliance because they forgot? In fact, when I have had my every couple years bad cold, I actually have to keep a note notes of when I took what cough syrup, when I took what if I have an antibiotic or whatever, I have to keep a notepad because I will mess it up. And imagine if this is every day. And if you're going to multiple specialists and maybe they're changing your medication, a lot of us have loved ones that medication compliance is falling by the wayside, that they have agreed with their doctor or their provider. Yes, I do need this medicine. I do want to take this medicine, but I forgot to take it or I'm late taking it or I skipped yesterday. And so if you can relate to that, if you've had that happen with your loved one, that would be another why or yes for your column. So uh, I'm just curious how many, I'm going to back up, how many people have gotten into more than three whys, more than three yeses? If anybody would like to share. Yeah, getting some folks saying yes. If you've got more than three, it's definitely time to look at what you're going to do differently. Is it time to move? So let's examine further. And again, for those who are here, I know we have a couple of folks on that are not, you're here for yourself. But these, if, if you're pretty in pretty good shape, then, then you probably haven't gotten quite to this issue. But it might be a worthy exercise to, to do with your adult kids or your family members that might help you out from time to time. But family members, I also want you to function as one or more of the following roles. Are you the daughter that takes mom out for a movie and then you go about your evening and hang out with your spouse and your kids or you go out with your friends for a drink? Or do you feel like you have to stay after you go to the movies with mom because you're her nursing assistant? You have to make sure she doesn't fall. You got to be her medicine aide. You got to make sure she's taking her meds. That you're picking her up for the movies, but, but she's relying on you also to take her to all her medical appointments. She forgets something uh, at the store. You got to run an errand for her. You're cooking. Can you tell me, is anybody relating to this, feeling like you're taking on more than one or more of these roles on a regular basis and not temporarily? Write into the chat section if you feel like you've, uh, just put a why if you're feeling like you're taking on one or more of these roles regularly. Yeah, we've got some people saying yes. So, Again, this is a time to be thinking about what is our future going to look like? Um, yeah, okay, so you've tired a daily aid to take on those roles, which is great. And having help in the home can be great, especially if it's temporary. But one of the downsides of that is still the isolation. It's the socialization. It's having that interaction with just that one other person. Whereas when you look at senior living, there's an opportunity to meet many people and engage in all kinds of stimulating activities, which, by the way, reduce isolation, which is affiliated with, due to the, liter uh, the literature it shares with us, that reduce, it is um, associated with less cognitive challenges, less physical challenges, and less mental health challenges. So the more that we are engaged socially, we reap physical, mental health, and cognitive benefits. So in my book, Cruising Through Caregiving, in chapter three, I give you starter conversations for how do you have this talk with your loved one? Uh, before I get it, I'm going to talk about the starter conversations in a moment. But the first thing I want to encourage adult kids on this program to do is to don't assume that your loved one, unless you know that you've had this conversation, don't assume that they would never move. I believe that a lot of families get themselves really stressed out because they just, oh, she would never move. There would never be an opportunity for her. She would never consider it. But it might be that they have a neighbor or they have a friend or that they've considered it. And they, they know that it might be an option at some point, that they, they don't want to move in with you. They don't want you moving in with them. They don't want you at their house all the time. 
because you're losing the intimacy of your daughter son parent relationship that you're becoming their housekeeper their medicine aide their nursing assistant so some questions are what's the most difficult part of living alone for you right now or if it's two people what's the most difficult part for you and dad living on your own right now as you're getting older what's the hardest part right now and capitalize when you see any sorts of natural openings. So when you see your mom struggle on the stairs in her house, you can bring that up. How hard are you finding it the stairs lately? You seem like you're having some challenges. Try not to be critical, but ask open-ended questions. Another one. How much longer do you see yourself in the house now that you have trouble with stairs? How much longer do you see yourself in the house because you have three acres? Especially when you're seeing multiple hospitalizations. And when we're seeing multiple hospitalizations, that is a red flag that things are going downhill and things will probably continue to go downhill until we make a change you have to make a change uh, that maybe having nursing around is going to be very helpful to prevent hospitalizations. And that is something that can be achieved by utilizing assisted living. But what challenges have you had at home since you got out of the hospital or since you've had all these hospitalizations in the last couple of months? What's the biggest challenge been? I think a lot of times people that are discharged from the hospital are very shocked how little help they get from Medicare after the, the discharge that, okay, well, somebody comes in and checks on me or I get a couple days of an aid coming in, but it's not indefinite. It's not, it's not going on for a long period of time. What do you like most about your house? What do you like least? So for example, I actually was in a senior living. Actually, I had my mother-in-law do a tour of a bright view my husband and I are sort of hoping that at some point she'll cons consider the Bright View in her community. Uh, we really like the Bright View in her community. We like Bright View is a wonderful organization. But my one of the uh, the person that gave the tour uh, said, "Well, tell me about your hobbies and what do like what do you like about your house?" And my mother in law talked a lot about her garden. And so the person that was giving the tour at Bright View shared, "Well." That's great because we have a gardening club. A lot of times people are very reluctant to think about moving if they think they're going to be giving up too much. Now, is having a gardening club exactly the same as having your own garden? No, there's good things. There's pros and cons. Yes, you maybe you can't pick everything that's planted, but you can meet new people. Maybe you're going to learn new things about gardening if you're in a club. Another question, what do you like the least? What's the toughest part? Of, what, what do you least like about your house? Maybe it's the maintenance. Maybe it's the fact that you're alone and you don't have somebody with you all the time or you're, you're feeling lonely or you feel like you're watching too much TV because you're not interacting with other people. But these are some questions that can really help. What do you find most comforting about your home? And that's a wonderful sign if someone's able to answer that, that can help you when you're considering where to place your loved one. What's important now, for example, just, just, uh, just, it could be anything. It could be that I have privacy. Well, because a lot of older adults feel or forget that there are options like assisted living and independent living, and they go right to the nursing home. They think that's, that's what it's all about. They, can feel really reassured when they know that they would have their own apartment, their own private bathroom. You're not gonna have to share a bathroom with anybody. So finding out what is comforting, or I love to be able to make myself my, so my, I make the best mac and cheese. And so one of the things I find comforting after I've been traveling and I travel a lot for my job, I'm sure some of you do too, but when I come home after being away for a while, I love to make my mac and cheese like from scratch. And I find that really comforting. And if I had to move somewhere where I wasn't going to be able to make my own macaroni and cheese, I think I would be very upset. But again, I think a lot of older adults have this idea. Well, in 
most aspects of moving to a Brightview community, and Karen, I'm sure could answer if, if anybody had questions about the memory care area of Wellspring Village, but definitely in independent assisted living, if I moved there, I could make my mac and cheese. Yes, there's meals available to me in the dining room, restaurant style, beautiful. But if I want the comfort of making my mac and cheese, I'd be able to do that. So in terms of creating a plan, what will you do going forward? So I want you to just be thinking about what we're talking about here today. What do you need to do? Is it that you want to have a next conversation with your loved one? Is it time to take a tour? Is it time to go have a meal at a bright view? Is it time to simply just talk to your siblings if you have siblings about this? But what do you wanna do going forward to take one step further to looking at preparing? And for those folks who said that they were on this program for themselves, but also what about if it's for your parent? What, what do you need to do? What will you do going forward to make some progress toward looking at improving quality of life for yourself and your loved one? I can promise you that if your loved one's life, quality of life is going down, and if you are a daughter or son that's involved, your quality of life will go down too. So if you said your quality of life was good today, that's terrific, but when you're, if your loved one begins to have more, more trouble, it's likely that their quality of life will go down and your quality of life will go down. So I want everybody to feel comfortable writing into the, the chat section. Do you have a comment about what you might be able to do going forward? What kind of plan would you like to create going forward? What will you stop doing? Is there anything that you should stop doing in order for your loved one to realize that maybe they need a little bit more than you stopping by to help? Uh, Dorothy is saying stuck because mom and dad are not on the same page. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that you say that oh, getting to see the doctor, getting an evaluation, Susan. Yeah, um, that happens a lot, Dorothea. That happens a lot. But I'm going to talk about some resources that can potentially help you with that. And if you would like to share, Dorothea, any more information about what's going on with your parents, I would be glad to listen. If you want to write it in the chat section, if you if there's something going on specifically with your mom and your dad, uh, if there's diagnoses or if there's anything in particular you want to share. So a couple of resources, and we just had somebody bring up having an evaluation with a doctor talking with a like licensed psychotherapist or a coach, talking to a support group. I think that all of these can be very, very helpful in giving you support on looking at the next step. What do you want to keep doing? What do you want to stop doing? Um, again, if Dorothy, if you're interested, I really would love to hear if there's anything specific about your, either one of your parents that you can share, just so I can maybe give you a little bit of feedback. But also know that the folks that do the touring at Bright Views are very highly trained. And they often, one of the things I love about Bright View, and I actually write about this in my second book, is one of their commitments to customer service is that even if you don't move there, they try to help you as much as they can. They try to share resources with you. And so even if you don't wind up moving in, a lot of times they are able to get you connected with a resource that will help you. Uh, but looking at the doctor as a potential help, maybe talking things through with a therapist or a coach that works in this area, but caregiver support groups for those who are adult kids can be very, very helpful. If you're working with, if you, if you're working, if you are loving somebody who has a dementia diagnosis, obviously there's dementia specific, but there's also one strictly just for caregivers. Dad's physically okay, but memory, mom's got dialysis and getting weak, multiple hospitalizations. So uh, mom is the one I'm guessing Dorothea that does not want to leave. And I guess my question would be, couldn't they move together? 
And my other question for mom, if she's cognitive, she's okay leaving, dad is not. I'm not sure how far along he is with his cognition, but a couple things to keep in mind. Um, in I write about this in the dementia chapter in Cruising Through Caregiving. Sometimes the decision simply has to be made if he has advanced dementia, if he still no longer has his capability to uh, truly make decisions. If he is not considered decisional or having capacity, sometimes you just have to rip off the Band-Aid and mom and you and your family need to just make the move. Because if mom continues to get weaker and she keeps having hospitalizations, there's probably a lot that you're going to see unfold when your mom, if your mom dies before your dad. And it, it, it would just be wonderful to be able to see that they're both in a safe place because this is, I'm guessing that she's doing a lot for him um, in terms of the memory and the TIA. So really, I think, um, and I don't know how far along he is, if he's early, middle, or late with his cognitive issues, but this is something that we see all the time. And if you talk to Brightview uh, teams about it, they definitely can guide you. It's a very common issue, but sometimes you just, you really do have to rip off the Band-Aid and say, that, and, and just move. Now, if he's very early in dementia and still is mostly has moments that are just like you and I, then it's probably not going to be so much of an option, but it, it, it's it's definitely something that you want to talk. Yeah. Um, Susan's saying it helps for the doctors to say, I, mom needs to be assisted living, no longer driving. Karen sharing, she's happy to help. And she's giving you the email address, kwilliams at bbsl.net. Her number is 410. 458-4537. There's a psychiatrist. I really love his books, Dr. Burns, David Burns, and he writes about anxiety and depression. And his book, Feeling Good, talks about the concept of action begets motivation, begets more action. And right now, obviously, many of you are very motivated. You want to, you're on this program. You want to find out how do I talk to my loved one? How do I do better? But how do I broach the topic? But taking a little bit of action today is going to motivate you to take more action. And he talks about that as it relates to depression, but I feel like it really definitely applies to what we're talking about today. Just taking a little bit of action, maybe taking a tour, maybe starting a conversation with your loved one, maybe having a conversation with your siblings about it if you have siblings, but doing something small and then you'll feel more motivated to take more action. And keep in mind that starting these conversations, a lot of it can be something that's going on in pop culture. Uh, with If you see somebody that is an older person that's talking about uh, in, in the public eye that's talking about their uh, parents. Um, Seth and Lauren Rogan, uh, they have a nonprofit called HFC Hilarity for Charity, and they provide help to people who have Alzheimer's and their families. And Lauren Miller Rogan and Seth Rogan talk about her, how they help her dad or how they helped her mom. And sometimes like when you see something like that in pop culture or you see it on the news or you see something like that where it's somebody's in the public eye talking about these issues, it's a great conversation starter. Talking about your own, what your wishes are for you can be a great conversation starter. Oh, gosh, well, I, my plan is, you know, my husband and I talk about that all the time. We, we plan that we probably will move to senior living someday. Uh, it could be that, you know, oh, I have a neighbor whose mom just absolutely loves the community, the great view that they're in. But look for natural openings where you're able to bring up the topic in a way that is maybe doesn't feel as forced. And some other suggestions would be, be careful if, if your parents still live in the house that you grew up in, maybe don't have this conversation at the kitchen table where you ate breakfast when you were four years old. 
you know, there, that's probably going to be putting you in the, the feeling of maybe you're still a little kid, no matter how old, if you're 50, 70, whatever, it can still really be hard to talk to your parents. But sometimes while driving, it can be great while you're out doing shopping together, just having these conversations gently. I think maybe not sitting the person down and saying that we have to have this conversation today about what's going on with you. Sometimes you need to do that, especially when there's a crisis and we want you all to avoid a crisis. Karen and Stephanie and I, we constantly see crises in this field that people just have to move tomorrow. Just no way for them to go home. And that's what you want to try to prevent. That's what you want to try to avoid having, having a plan, getting prepared ahead of time. And keep in mind that this is definitely something that is an adjustment when somebody does move ultimately it can take some time it is a big step so be prepared that when your loved one does move it's it's just a bit of an adjustment to 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 meet people and and uh to get acclimated to just a little bit of a different lifestyle but ultimately most people are very happy that they they make the move so I want to keep it open for any comments, any questions at all that anybody would like to share. Uh, in conclusion, I just want to encourage everybody to consider taking a tour with the Brightview communities. If you haven't already, they have lots of wonderful programming and events. Go join them for a meal. But I wish you the best in talking with your parents and keep in mind, they are always a grown up. No matter what diagnosis they have, have the conversation with respect, have the conversation, remember that they're an adult and you will be on a good path. One of the best things that I was able to do when I had conversations with my grandmother is I would always remind her, it's your decision. It's your decision. You can move, you can not move, but we had choices. We as the family members had choices. If she didn't want to move, there were people in the family that weren't going to be able to sleep over anymore. They weren't going to be able to miss work anymore. They were only going to be able to drive you to the doctor once a week. So your loved one's an adult. If they don't have dementia, they do get the final say. But be mindful about propping them up. When people feel that they're living independently, they don't feel that they're, they're struggling, then it can be harder to convince them that they might need senior living. Thank you very, very much grateful for uh, the opportunity to work with you today. And I'm going to turn it back over to Stephanie. Thank you so much, Jen. A lot of great information, a lot of great perspectives. And thanks to everybody for their questions and their comments and their participation. Uh, I'm sure it was all helpful to, to hear all of that, um, knowing that everybody is having the, um, some, some similarities and you're not alone. Thank you so, so, so much for Brightview Senior Living, uh, Karen Williams for sponsoring today's program. Um, we're we're very grateful for the opportunity that they've provided. Um, so we hope that you're going to be able to check them out. Um, oh, sorry. Thank you, everybody. I want to just, again, thank everybody for joining us today. Thanks to Jen for that great information, um, great conversations, great questions. Um, a multitude of thanks for Karen Williams and Brightview Senior Living for sponsoring today's program. Um, we're really grateful for this opportunity that you've afforded individuals. You'll see in the chat feature that we did happen uh, to put in an evaluation. So please take a moment. It will take you all of about 30 seconds. If you could please um, click on that and you will be able to complete a very short survey and evaluation. That would be great. Um, and as Karen echoed the session will happen again on September 26th at 6 p.m. So if you'd like to invite a loved one to attend or know somebody else who could benefit, I'm sure they'd be grateful for it. Thank you so much for joining us today and um, have a peaceful weekend.